Hello and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhat. In this session, we would look at AIS 12, which deals with income taxes. This topic is covered in international accounting, the CPA exam, and the ACCA exam. As always, I would like to remind you to connect with me on LinkedIn if you haven't done so. YouTube is where you would need to subscribe. I have 1,500 plus accounting, auditing, and tax lecture. Please like my YouTube. Click on the like button if you like them, share them, put them in the playlist, let the world know about them. If you're listening to me now, it means you're benefiting. Share the wealth, let other people benefit as well. This is my Instagram account, this is my Facebook account, and I do have a website. On my website, if you choose to support the channel, please, you can do so by making a donation. Also on my website, I do have offers right now. For example, Becker CPA Review is offering $1,000 off of the Becker bundle, which is four parts CPA exam. You can have all four parts for $2,987, $1,000 off. It's not only that. Now it's with unlimited access. Unlimited access means you can, you can have the course as long as you need it. This means even if you may not be studying now for the exam, if you are still a college student and you can invest in such a course, it's a good idea for you. Why? Because you can use the thousands of multiple choice questions, more than 2000, and lectures by qualified Becker faculty to supplement your college studies. Let's go ahead and get started and let's talk about income taxes. Now, the first thing I want to do is make a disclosure. Clearly, this complex is topic, quite topic, and I'm going to be covering this topic in maybe 20, 25 minutes. I don't know how, how long this topic it's going to take us. This is not an intermediate accounting course. What am I trying to say to explain the topic? So if you're looking to understand income taxes, you have to go to my chapter 19 intermediate accounting. I have nine different lectures. I have nine different lectures over, I would say, three hours plus to understand in accounting for income taxes. This this course is international accounting. This course touches upon the differences between US GAAP and IFRS. But if you really want to learn how we book the entries, what is the fair tax asset exactly? What's the fair tax liability? How to how to how to handle net operating losses? You have to view the lecture. So again, this is not intermediate accounting. And you're going to see in the next few sessions, I'm going to be making this reminders because the next topic will be revenue recognition. And we're going to be covering revenue recognition very briefly while I have 18 different lectures in, in my intermediate accounting channel. So the reason I'm saying this in case you are like, I'm confused, I really don't know what's going on is because you don't have a good understanding of the accounting for income taxes, which is the third tax asset, the third tax liability, income tax refundable, current taxes, the third taxes, so on and so forth. Okay. The good news is IAS 12 and US GAAP take a similar approach in accounting for income taxes. That's the good news. So if you go to my channel, you would learn US GAAP and you should be good to go. And I know many international students, they listen to my recording and they're good to go. They'll be able to understand the material. What does it mean they, they use similar approach? It means they use what's called the asset liability approach that recognizes the third tax asset and the third tax liability for temporary differences and operating loss and tax credit carry forward. What does the balance sheet approach means? It means when we're looking to compute the differences between income tax and accounting, here's what we have to understand. There are two words. Words means two, two separate books. Okay. And we have the tax record and we have the accounting record, at least two, if not more. Now in the US, when we prepare our income tax, we have to follow the internal revenue service, which is a government agency. Now in your country, they follow some other, some other agency, but the IRS is an example. For accounting, we follow US GAAP, US generally accepted accounting principle. Now we, the way we tax things for US GAAP is different than I, IFRS. I'll give you an example just to illustrate the point, maybe two examples. For example, if we rent a building, if we rent a building and we receive, let's assume we receive, we rent a building up front for five years. It's commercial lease. And we receive up front for every year, we receive $50,000, $50,000. Now, for tax purposes, what we do is we have $50,000 of income of taxable income. 
So we're gonna be paying taxes on the fifty thousand dollar. Let's assume just for the sake of simplicity, twenty percent rate. So we're gonna to have to pay ten thousand dollar in taxes. So the whole fifty thousand dollar is tax. Now for gap purposes, guess what? This fifty thousand will have to be allocated over five years. And for every year, we're only gonna be recognizing ten thousand dollar in income. Now, $10,000 in income means for, let's assume that we're, we're dealing with 2019, 2019. In 2019, we only have $10,000 in income as far as accounting rules. What happened to the other 40,000? And this is where we have to look at the asset liability approach. For accounting purposes, we're gonna have an account receivable of $40,000. Um, why? Because the, the, we still have to rec I'm sorry. Um, I apologize. It's not account receivable. We receive the cash. We have an unearned revenue. We have unearned revenue of forty thousand dollar by the end of the year. Of forty thousand dollar. Why forty thousand dollar? Because we recognize ten thousand of revenue. We received. We received the cash. Ten thousand was revenue, and forty thousand was unearned revenue. Now under the tax rule we tax the whole thing so we have no unearned revenue so for the tax rules if we look our unearned revenue if we look under unearned revenue notice we have zero we have zero unearned revenue because everything was taxed everything was considered income so the difference between the liability the for the, the book a liability of zero and forty thousand it's what's gonna it's what's gonna arise to the difference to the temporary difference so we look at the asset and the liability and the same concept would apply if we have an account receivable if we have an account receivable basically put if we provide a service we debit account receivable let me work another example this way since i already opened that pandora box so let's just make it clearer it's easier to just work similar example okay for account receivable again let's look at this let's assume we provided twenty thousand worth of services we debit account receivable we credit revenue twenty thousand so we have the receivable and we have the revenue now for tax purposes under the um, under the u.s code there's no really no receivable because we did not receive any money there is no receivable so i'm just gonna do this just kind of to show you how it works i'm going to debit account receivable zero credit revenue zero just to kind of illustrate the point you don't do that but the point is notice we have a receivable of of zero a receivable of twenty thousand the difference between those two it's what's going to give us the temporary difference now eventually eventually we're going to receive the cash as we receive the cash in future years we're going to be receiving twenty thousand dollar of cash when we receive the cash we debit cash credit revenue here in future years for accounting purposes when we receive the cash we debit cash and credit the receivable credit the receivable twenty thousand and twenty thousand in future years we're gonna have we're gonna we're gonna have uh this twenty thousand dollar of receivable would reverse Again, this will create a temporary difference, but it, it's at reverse. So this is what we meant to say. They adopt the asset liability approach. And this is the simplest and the quickest explanation I can give you for this topic. What do you have to do? You have to learn. The assumption is, is you already have you, you already have to know it. So differences do exist, but to a great degree, they use the same approach, which is the asset liability approach. And we're going to see the differences later on really quick. The next question we have to discuss is which tax rate do they use so when you're computing your deferred tax asset deferred tax liability what's the rate what's the percentage because the rate comes with a tax okay IAS required that current and deferred taxes must be measured on the basis of the tax law that has been enacted or substantially enacted pretty much the same language as as uh, as US gap US gap it says been enacted now we need to know how do we define been enacted now we have to understand it vary from country to country because how the u.s passes their law through u.s congress could be different than argentina could be different than germany could be different than france but the point is the iasb has published guidelines that address the point 
in time when a tax change is substantially enacted. And when is that enacted? It's when you cannot change the outcome, when the outcome is fixed, when you cannot change the outcome. Simply put, when the when the legislature of power takes action and pass the law, this is when it's enacted. For example, in the U.S., the point of substantive enactment is when the tax law is passed by U.S. Congress. Okay, And U.S. GAAP require measurement of income that's using actually enacted tax law and rate. So enacted means they already passed and passed by who? By Congress. Okay. So which tax rate to use? Okay. To minimize the double taxation, let just because sometimes there, there's more than one tax rate. To minimize the double taxation of corporate dividend, which is taxes paid by the company than taxes paid by the shareholder, some countries apply a lower tax rate to profit that are distributed to shareholder than profit that are retained. So in some countries, what, what happened is you have two different tax rates. One, if you keep the profit, we tax you differently than if you distribute the profit. Okay. So what's going to happen if you're doing business in those countries, you need to know which tax rate are you going to be using when you compute your current and deferred taxes because it makes a difference. All right. Example provided, actually they have example provided specifically in IS 12 indicate that the tax rate that applies to the undistributed profit, because usually that's a higher tax, should be used to measure the tax expense. Okay, so that's what we're saying. Sometimes there's more than one tax rate. So let's take a look at an example to illustrate how this works. Let's assume a multinational owns a subsidiary in a foreign jurisdiction where income taxes are payable at a higher rate on undistributed profit than distributed profit. Okay, so if, you, if the company keeps the money, they will be taxed at a higher rate than if they would have distributed the money. For the first year, the foreign subsidiary has income of 150000 The foreign subsidiary also has a net taxable temporary difference amounting to 50000 which is going to give us a deferred tax liability. Now, if you don't know what this is, it's... It means we're going to be responsible for paying more taxes down the road. Why are we going to be paying more taxes? Because we're going to be losing a deduction or having more income. So this 50000 we don't know what it is. It's either we're going to have less expenses in future years or more income as a result of a change in an asset and liability. But they told us it's a deferred tax liability. The tax rate... The tax rate paid in the foreign country on undistributed profit is 40000 The tax rate on... I'm, on, I'm sorry, on distributed profit is 40000 Undistributed profit is 50000 They Basically, they want, they tax you for half of your money. This looks like, sounds like a European country. Okay, just, just joking. Um, a tax credit arises when the undistributed profit are later distributed. So after you distribute the profit, guess what's going to happen? They'll give you a 10% ta tax credit because you're supposed to be only taxed at 40%. At, uh, Okay. As of the balance sheet date, no distribution of dividend has been proposed or declared. So they have 150000 of income. Well, guess what? What's going to happen is then in year two, they distribute 75000 In year two, they distribute the 75000 So in year one, we have to find the tax. We have to tax you on the 150000 The 150000 it's going to be 50%. We have to pay taxes of 75000 So we're going to debit current tax current tax expense, credit income taxes payable, and to be more specific, current. So this is how much you have to pay this year. Well, not 75,000. This is 75,000. So we figured out the current taxes. Now, what we are told in the problem, we are told, and I'm going to highlight it in yellow, we are told that we have a temporary difference of 50000 that gave us a deferred tax liability. What does that mean? It means in the future, we're going to be responsible for more taxes. How much taxes we're going to be responsible for? Well, it's it's going to be an additional 50000 Additional 50000 of temporary difference. It means we have to pay 50% taxes on this. It means we are responsible for an additional 25000 We have to book deferred, deferred tax expense. Notice they're both expenses. One you have to pay now, and the other one you have to book for the future, 25000 And deferred tax liability of 25000 Simply put, this is the deferred or non-current portion. Let's just call it the deferred portion of taxes. So simply put, my total income tax expense is my deferred component and my current component. So my taxes are seven in total. 75 plus 25 is 100,000. That's my total tax. Part of it, part of it current and part of it is deferred. Now remember in year two, they paid the dividend. They paid $75,000 in dividend. When you pay the dividend, remember when you pay the dividend, if you paid 75,000, you're going to get 10% tax credit. Why 10% tax credit? Because originally they taxed you at 50%. Then when you distribute, they give you a credit as if you distribute the 
money initially, which your rate should be 40, therefore the difference is 10%. So you have a credit, which is a receivable now, you're waiting for a receivable of 7,500, and you have what's called, you, you would reduce your income tax expense for that year by not 25,000, not 7,500. Um, seven, I'm sorry, 7,500, yeah, 7,500, sorry, I, I copied the numbers from the other slide. So you have a tax credit or tax receivable of 7,500, and you would reduce your current income tax. Yeah, you would reduce your current tax, income tax expense. So for that year, you reduce your current income tax expense, which is for year two, which will be a reduction to this account, reduction to this account, because what happened is you paid the, you paid the dividend now, therefore your taxes should go, should go down, should go down, okay? So let's talk about a little bit more about the recognition of the third taxed asset. Um, the IAS 12 require recognition of the third taxed asset if the future realization of the tax benefit is probable. Where probable is undefined. So they don't tell you what probable is in IAS 12. They tell you if it's probable. They don't really tell you how to compute probability. Now, why is that an issue? What are you saying? When I say I have a deferred tax asset, when you say I'm going to be creating a deferred tax asset, I'm going to be creating a deferred tax asset, it means I'm creating an asset. What does that asset represent? What is the deferred tax asset means? It means in the future, you're going to have a tax savings. Why will you have a tax saving? Why will you have a tax saving in the future? Two reasons you could have a tax savings. You're going to have more expenses for tax purposes more expenses for tax purposes, that's one reason, or less revenue for tax purposes compared to now. Let me just explain this. Okay, you would have a deferred tax asset because you're either going to have more expenses, more expenses that you could not take now. This year, you cannot take the expense, you're going to take it later, or less revenue in the future. You remember the rental uh, example I told you we paid we paid when we received the fifty thousand dollar of rental up front we taxed the whole thing we taxed the whole amount uh, all all in 2019 now this money was for five years so in the next five years you're supposed to tax ten thousand ten thousand ten thousand you already taxed the whole amount next four years because you know ten thousand is considered in year one so basically in the next four years you have zero taxes Zero taxes on that 50,000 of revenue because you taxed the whole thing in 2019. So because of that, what you do is you book a deferred taxed asset, but you have to be very careful. Deferred tax asset means gonna give you future savings. Well, if you don't have any taxable income, your future savings should not be there. So you wanna make sure when you have a deferred taxed asset, ask yourself, am I gonna have taxable income? Because if you're not paying taxes, what good is the savings? Because you're not paying, if your taxes are going to be zero because you have no, no income, what if I gave you a million dollars in savings? Well, I don't have any bill, so you can give me as much as possible. So you only recognize it when it's when it's realizable. You, you know it's, you're going to use it, okay? Under U.S. GAAP, a deferred tax asset must be recognized if the realization is more likely than not. Under U.S. GAAP, they are less stringent. More likely than not, there's a good, a good percent chance, then you can do it. They're more liberal. IAS is more stringent, okay? Let's take a look at an example to show you how it works from a... Um, operating loss perspective. During the fiscal year, December, 3rd, December 31st, this company had a net operating loss of 450,000. So the company had a loss. What happened is this, if you have losses this year, you could, you could not use, but you could carry your losses forward because you could carry your losses forward. The loss is gonna give you future taxable savings. Basically the loss is like a deduction for, for you in the future. This future, that taxable saving it's going to give you it's going to give you the rise to a deferred taxed asset to a deferred taxed asset so let's let's take a look at it because the company has experience and losses in the last several years it cannot use the nol carry back so there sometimes you could go back but they cannot go back because also and in, in prior year they have losses so in some countries they allow you to go back now in the us they don't allow you to go back anymore but in some countries they allow you to go back in future years and get a refund but here they're saying you had losses in, 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 in future years, uh, in prior years anyway. However, the company has negotiated several new contracts and management expect that it's slightly more than 50% that it will likely be able to utilize one third of the net operating loss in future years. Now what happened is the company thinks, guess what? We have a new contract. 
things are looking good we're going to have some income therefore what's going to happen is we're going to be able to realize we're going to be able to take advantage of this well the company effective rate is 40 percent now depending on how we define the likelihood we're assuming it's it's going to occur the word probable it's going to occur more than 50 more than 50 percent we expect to be able to realize 40 percent of that 450,000 so what we cannot realize the whole thing but we think 40 percent of 450,000 you know it's going to be realizable therefore that's going to translate into 60,000 of the third tax asset so we book the third tax asset 60,000 credit income tax benefit 60,000 simply put we're going to have 60,000 of savings of tax savings in the future tax savings in the future because we have we have a loss that we're carrying over and this is what a deferred tax asset is basically again us gap and ifrs they treat it the same way go go to my uh, intermediate accounting if you don't understand what the the uh, the computation here disclosure real quick uh, let's talk about disclosure IAS require extensive disclosure to be made with regard to income taxes including disclosure of the current and the deferred tax component remember every time you compute your taxes you have two two taxes you have the current portion and the deferred portion and hopefully you know this the standard also require an explanation of the relationship between the hypothetical tax expense based on the statutory tax rate and the reported tax expense based on the effective tax rate using one of the two approaches simply put you're going to have a hypothetical tax expense tax expense a hypothetical one and you're going to have the effective one the effective one is what you actually end up paying what the effective is what did you end up paying that's 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 the effective and the tax expense the hypothetical one is based on the rate the rate is this much well the rate is this much but how much did you end up paying because there, there are going to be differences between the tax expense what the tax rate in a certain country is for example in the u.s just to give you a quick example right now the tax rate for corporation is 21 percent that's the tax rate that's on the books but when the company actually paid their taxes they could what they end up paying maybe 10 percent maybe three percent maybe negative ten percent it means they get a refund okay so the hypothetical rate is twenty percent but the effective rate they get a refund why because there are other deductions other other things that gave them credit there are some tax credit that gave them a refund or reduced their tax rates so this is what we meant by hypothetical tax expense so as far as IAS concerned you have to reconcile those two you have to show what is your hypothetical tax expense and what's your actual what's your effective there are two ways to build that do two ways to build that uh, reconciliation one is a numerical reconciliation between the tax expense based on the statutory tax rate in the home country so what's your tax rate in the home country and the tax expense based on the effective rate and what was your actual effective rate so this is what your rate is like 20 percent but what's your effective it could be more it could be higher it could be higher it could be lower okay or you could you could take you could do this reconciliation between the tax expense based on the weighted average statutory tax rate across jurisdiction you might be in many different countries in which the company pay taxes and the tax expense based on the effective rate or you could look at the weighted average so you look at your income from various countries and you and you compute your weighted average based on the various taxes and you say this is what it should be the weighted average but i actually paid that much why would you pay different than the weighted average because there are other credits and deductions that may or may not take may may or may not be factored into your tax computation and the best way to kind of just give you a sense of this is to look at an example let's take a look at this company it's a british company tesco plc and look at their uh, tax rate their tax rate is 20 percent. so their tax their tax rate is 20 percent okay and they pay 29 million that's the tax rate however total income tax charge for the year is 87 million so hold on a second how did they go from 20 million if 20 percent which gave them um it's kind of let me just do this computation real quick just to show you where the numbers are coming from so if we take profit before taxes which is 145 million times 0.2 and that's going to give us 29 so this is where the 29 came from it's it's their profit times 20 percent this is what the that's what the rate in the uk but what the company ended up paying is 87 million now why did they that why did they end up paying 87 million look there are reconciliation they're showing you why did we pay more why did we pay more well one major reason is there's this two, this 82 million here and if you look in the notes of the financial statement for this company this was 
basically a penalty against this company, a tax penalty for false or misleading financial statements. So that's why they have they had to pay more taxes, and as a result, they end up paying 87. That, that's, that, that's not the only reconciliation. Look, they have also some credit, property item tax on a different basis to accounting entries, and they have other taxes too. But overall, they end up paying more taxes. Therefore, the effective rate was 60%, although the home rate is 20%, not the home rate, the country rate, the country rate for such corporation is 20%. For just for the sake of just to tell you how crazy this is, let's look at 2016, the prior period, the rate was 20.1. But as a result of certain adjustment, the company got a credit. Basically, the government sent them a check for 54 million and their effective rate was negative. Notice here, it's negative 26.6. Simply put, the company will have to show what was the the tax rate in that home country and what's what did we actually end up paying this is what we meant by the reconciliation and this is using this this method basically looking at the home country tax rate versus the effective rate another way to do it the way nestle did it is basically looking at the weighted average applicable tax rate and they don't give us the percentage here but based on that percentage this is how much taxes they should pay plus or minus the adjustments which is mostly plus 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 more taxes they end up paying this much okay so just the way they compute it it doesn't matter tomato tomato it's just it's a different way of computing that reconciliation but you have to show those two figures how much i would have paid under the applicable tax rate because we have here we have many jurisdiction that's why they use the weighted average and how much i end up paying show me the difference so show me the difference why did that difference occur if we look in here just kind of show you those are two major reasons one is change in tax rate there was change in tax rate and withholding tax levied on transfer of income again that could be anything you need a tax expert to explain this for you okay in the prior year they had a big tax credit prior year taxes so they get a refund from the government here in 2015 okay just this is what i understand prior year tax okay compared to us gap let's just take a look at a few more things Temporary difference, there are certain temporary differences that are unknown under US GAAP. One of the temporary differences is re-evaluation of property, plant, and equipment. And we talked about this in IES 16. Under US GAAP, we don't have such such a temporary difference because we don't revalue property, plant, and equipment. So although they use the same method, but there are certain things that under IFRS may be different under US GAAP, certain rules. Other rules, how we determine the impairment and the amount of the impairment loss is different between IFRS and US GAAP. However, for presentation purposes, and this is the good news, it used to be different, now it's easy. For uh, IES 1, presentation of financial statements stipulate that deferred taxes may not be classified as current asset or current liabilities, only non-current. So the question is, how should we present current uh, deferred tax asset and deferred tax liability? The answer is easy, non-current. It used to be very complicated for US GAAP. There used to be some current, some non-current, and you have to determine based on the status of the asset or the liability. Now it's easy. For both US GAAP and IFRS, and this is part of the convergence, they report, they net them out, and they report net uh, non-current asset and not net non-current liability. So you cannot have uh, current. You cannot have current. And basically, that's it for this session. Again, um, if you feel you are shortchanged, it's, I don't know how long it's going to, how long the session took, but if you really want to understand accounting for income taxes, you need to spend three to four hours listening to my lecture to have a good understanding. This is an overview. This is not an intermediate accounting course. The assumption is you took your intermediate accounting, and this is just to give you an overview of the difference. If you happen to visit my website for additional lectures or my YouTube, please consider donating if you're studying for your CPA exam. As always, study hard. It's worth it. Good luck.